Thank you so much, Liv. And let me just say, it's such an honor to be here. So I'm here to talk about the declining effectiveness of mass mobilization and what we can do about that. But before I get into that, let me just pose a fundamental question. Does nonviolence really work? Up until recently, it was a common assumption that nonviolence was less efficient than violence, that people would choose nonviolence either because they were morally convicted to do so or because they lacked the resources to wage an efficient armed struggle. But this had not been tested systematically. When Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stephan set out to collect a global data set spanning from 1900 to 2006 of nonviolent and violent large-scale maximalist campaigns, okay, that's a handful, but it means campaigns that apply a non-violent or a violent strategy, or both, mobilize more than 1,000 people and have a maximalist claim. So either to remove the sitting regime, secede from the state, or oust a foreign occupant. When analyzing these data, what they found was that non-violent campaigns were almost twice as likely to succeed compared to the violent ones. Or in other words, Gandhi was right. The central mechanism to why nonviolent campaigns are more likely to succeed than violent campaigns is a mobilization advantage. They are simply much better at mobilizing large number of people. Anyone can join a nonviolent campaign, also grandparents, but most of us would shy away from joining a violent one. As more people join, the pressure on the regime mounts, raising the costs of maintaining status quo and increasing the likelihood that the most important pillar of support, the security forces, so the military and the police, defects and shifts their allegiance to the campaign. When this happens, the regime is likely to crumble or introduce reforms themselves. But while it's one thing to remove an autocrat, it might be something else to uh, bring about democratic change. In several case cases, including Iran in 1979, Egypt in 2011, and Sudan in 2019, the campaign successfully removed the regime, but then to fall short of achieving democracy. Which brings us to the next questions. Do nonviolent campaigns increase the likelihood of democratic change? This is something we have studied. So the way to interpret this graph, if you look at the x-axis here, you see the years since the movement. A nonviolent up there in the black, uh, dark, or a violent one down here in light gray. So focus on the solid line for nonviolent campaigns. If it's above the zero line, indicating that our best guess, guess is that it increases, it brings about democratic change. Then the shaded area shows you how certain we are. If it crosses a zero line, as it does for the violent campaigns, it means that we're quite uncertain. But when it doesn't, it means that we are pretty certain about this. So as you can see, we're quite certain that once a country sees the start of a nonviolent campaign with democratic aspirations, the likelihood that democratic change will happen is higher. This is encouraging. It tells us something about agency, the potential power of mass mobilization to bring about democratic change and put the uh, country on a different path. But it also leaves us with something of a puzzle. As Liza John and others have talked about, we do find ourselves in the midst of an autocratic wave. Since 2006, for 17 consecutive years, we have seen declining rates of democracy. And during the same 17 years, we have also seen historically high numbers of mass mobilization. So this graph, which is from the report, it shows you 
the annual number of new democracy movements since 1945. It shows you that democracy movements have become increasingly popular. Uh, it peaked in 1989, at the end of the Cold War, and then it peaked again in the 2011, during the Arab Spring, but continued afterwards at high levels. Since 2006, even though we do not have the data for the last three years, almost half of the democracy campaigns in this graph have taken place. So this, knowing that mass mobilization has the capacity to bring, uh, bring about democratic change, it makes us ask, how do these trends go together? Okay, so there are many possible reasons to why this is the case. But one possibility is that mass mobilization no longer has a positive effect on the likelihood of democratic change. It could be that the positive and significant effect is limited to specific time periods. This is something we have tested. And as you can see, it seems to be the case. It wasn't before in 1979 that mass mobilization started to have a positive and significant effect on the likelihood of democratic change. This effect peaked around the late 1990s and then gradually declined. By 2013, it no longer had a significant effect. The graph it suggests that there was some sort of a golden era in the 1980s, 1990s, and then in the beginning of the 2000s. And the challenge now is to figure out how do we return to this. Full disclosure, I do not know. And we do not fully know what happened, what caused this shift, but we can speculate. It could be the changing geopolitical climate, it could be that cases today are simply harder than cases before. And it could be that something has happened on the side of the autocrats and the side of the campaign. So, let me elaborate on the last ones. It seems like autocrats have adapted. They have learned. They have learned from successful movements, or as they would say, see it, they have learned from failed autocrats. While they earlier seemed to be taken by surprise by mass movements, they now seem much more prepared. A key challenge for autocrats is to respond to a movement in such a way that it ends it, instead of provoking a backlash. To do this, they need a repression strategy, which installs fears and silences the movement, and not one that spreads grievances and thereby motivates more people to join the movement, as we saw in the aftermath of the brutal killings of Khaled Said in Egypt. One possible way autocrats have adapted is by shifting to more covert forms of repression, so less obvious forms, uh, more hidden, and therefore also less likely to backfire. There are some indications of a growing use of covert tactics. For example, it seems to have become increasingly common to neutralize opposition members through the geese of legitimate legal processes. Take, for example, the silencing of Navalny, who was imprisoned under legal pretexts. In addition, the spread of social media and the internet has greatly improved the regime's monitoring capabilities, making it easier for them to identify the most important members of the opposition. On the campaign side, the internet and social media has also had its effect. It has facilitated coordination outside traditional organizational structures. This approach has some advantages. Um, it can quickly mobilize many people, but it also comes with some disadvantages. Moving away from uh, traditional organization structures comes with some disadvantages. Our research shows us that movements that utilize pre-existing organizational structures, 
such as civil society organizations, such as unions, uh, religious groups, tend to be more su successful. These institutions provide uh, the infrastructure for mobilizing and platforms for planning and strategizing. They also strengthen a movement's capacity for maintaining momentum, adhering to the nonviolent discipline, and continuing even after the fall of the regime. All of these characteristics, which are really good, also have been shown to increase the likelihood that the campaign is successful in achieving democratic change. Therefore, for some campaigns, bringing the organizations back in might be a viable strategy. Lastly, as a seed of optimism, the graph I showed you, the one depicting the golden age and the declining success rate afterwards, if you extrapolate based on this into the future and draw the line, it paints a rather bleak picture. But it also shows you that history is not a straight line, and we do not know when these turning points occur. In the 1970s, no one foresaw the onset of this golden age. And similarly, we would not know it if we were currently standing on the brink of a new one. So, thank you very much.